All right, hey LS family, happy Sunday and welcome to Livingstone's Church at Home. Let's get through some announcements, shall we? So first off, we pray you all are keeping safe under this new stay at home order. If you haven't heard already, they are extending the stay at home order for two more weeks, but this time beaches and parks are open, but, but only you are only allowed to go individually. So I guess it's sad, but we still have the option, you know? And also let's remember to pray for each other and our communities and we will update you when we can start meeting in person again. Secondly, our Zoom Bible study meetings will continue this week, Tuesday at 7 p.m. for our EMs and Friday at 6 p.m. for our Livingstones Youth Group. So see you guys there. Thirdly, our bi-monthly River of Life community service meeting will be tomorrow, Monday, September 14th. We still need at least two volunteers to help pass out food to the homeless. If you are interested, please contact Pastor Daniel. Lastly, Tizen offerings can be made online at hawaiicpc.org slash offering, or you can drop them off at church. Okay, so today we are continuing with our sermon series on the Ten Commandments, and we are going to be learning about the Eighth Commandment, You Shall Not Steal. Let's keep our hearts open and receive His word. Enjoy the service. Mahalo. Hey guys, sorry. Before we get into the service, there's one more announcement I wanted to make. Um, on Saturday, September 19th, we will be in charge of church cleanup. The cleanup will start at 11 a.m. The more the merrier, so let's all come out and help clean the church. Um, look out for notifications later this week to confirm the time. Thank you and enjoy the service. Good morning, HCPC. Welcome to uh, Sunday worship. Um, really, um, really glad to see you guys, and uh, just can't wait to praise with you guys. If you guys can join with me in prayer and uh, worship the Lord, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for just uh, just being part of our lives, Lord. Uh, Lord, we ask you, Lord, to continue to uh, shine your light upon us uh, through these times. Uh, Father, watch over us. Um, and Lord, just, just remind us of, of who you are, Lord, and, um, and the, the part that you play in our lives, Lord. Um, Lord, uh, just remind us, constantly remind us of how important you are, Lord, to us. And uh, Father, we want to worship you, Lord. Just want to pray. Amen. Uh, if you guys look at the, the chat link on the bottom, if you guys could say hello to each other, good morning, um, you know, anything positive really encourage you guys to do so uh, but at this time let's worship history maker let's praise the lord this time let's pray <laughs> Now when people stand 
with the fire of God and the truth in hand. We'll see miracles. We'll see miracles. We'll see angels sing. We'll see broken hearts making history. Is it true? Yes, it's true. Jesus died my 
soul to see My lips shall still be Jesus, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin that led the crimson stain, He washed in white snow. Jesus, Jesus paid it all. Oh, praise the one. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise. Praise the song. Um, let's just offer uh, this song uh, to God and uh, let's worship Him at this time. Let's praise Him. And this praise the sun cannot compare. The sun cannot compare. To the glory of your love There is no shadow in your presence No more man would dare Stand before your throne Before the Holy One of Heaven And it's only by your blood And it's only through I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring.
Lord, um, and we, Father Lord, we pray Lord, that you continue to uh, uh, just send your love to us, Lord, uh, constantly watch over us, Lord. Uh, Father, we pray for Pastor Daniel as he gives a word, Lord, speak through him, and use him, Lord, as a tool so that he can uh, teach us, Lord, and you can speak through him, Lord. Uh, Father, be with our church, Lord, be with our brothers and sisters, uh, be with the victims of um, that, that are suffering uh, throughout this uh this pandemic, Lord, and pray, Lord, that you um, just uh, go ahead and spread your love throughout the islands, Lord. Father, be with us in Jesus' my pray. Amen. Good morning to you all, Living Stones. Happy Sunday. Um, I'm glad you're able to worship together. We're able to worship together. Uh, for those of you who may be joining us for the very first time, welcome. It is our prayer that when we are able to meet again in person, that you'd be able to join us at 1130 uh, in person, we'd love to give you uh, some of that aloha hospitality that we're so known for. Um, you've come at a, a good day. We are in week eight um, of a series that we're calling No Other Gods. We're looking at the Ten Commandments and how they're supposed to help shape our community. Um, just a few weeks before we went into a second lockdown here in Oahu, uh, we had made a major move to go ahead and be be intentional about being a multi-generational church. And in doing so, in sort of beginning this new ministry, we are looking towards the Ten Commandments because we were recognizing that God gave these commandments to His people as they formed a community. You see, these Ten Commandments weren't just ten rules given for all space and time. They were given specifically to a group of people after God had rescued them out of slavery. And so for us here today in 2020, we recognize that when we gather, we are called Living Stones because we have a common story. And our common story is that each and every single person in our group has had a, a rescue from our own personal uh, slavery, whatever that may be. Whether we were a slave to an addiction, whether we were slaves to just our constant inner voice saying that we're not good enough, whether we were a slave to fear and anxiety or a, or a very embarrassing moment from our past, whatever it is, we believe that God has redeemed us and he's called us together to shape and form this community now that seeks to worship him out of gratitude for what he's already done for us. So we are, are glad that you're joining us. If you miss any of our past sermon series here in the Ten Commandments on No Other God series, we have a YouTube playlist that we'd love for you to check out. It's on our YouTube channel. Click playlist and you'll see HCPC, HCPC Living Stones. It's our ministry's name and uh, all our, our past sermons will be there since we started this recording. Um, before we begin, would you join with me in a quick prayer and then we'll get to the Word of God here this morning. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for this time that we have together. We ask, Lord God, that from wherever we are, your Holy Spirit will speak to us and convict us and encourage us, Lord God, to live into this identity that we are your people. No matter what space and time we occupy, we are yours and you are our God, so we give you thanks. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are on the Eighth Commandment here. <clears throat> the Eighth Commandment comes to us from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 19. Let me read that for you. It's going to be really quick. 
Deuteronomy 5, verse 19 says, You shall not steal. You shall not steal. Now, um, out of all the commandments, this one seems like it should be the most straightforward. Don't steal. All right, I got it. Sermon over. See you all next week. <laughs> but hold up here. Hold up. Let's go through it. All right, let's go through it. And let's allow the Word of God to reveal to us as a community what God wants us to know. All right, and as we've been doing every other week in these in this series, we've been interpreting these commandments using a tool that we call SIS. It's an acronym, S-I-S. So let's apply that here uh, to this commandment. The first S stands for synecdoche, and the synecdoche of this commandment, do not steal, it is the greatest example of misusing the value of our possessions. Now, even further, not just misusing, but mis judging, misappropriating the value of the things that we've been given to possess. All right? That's the synecdoche. Do not steal the greatest example of misusing, misappropriating, misjudging our possessions. The I, inverse, do not steal, as this commandment says, also implies to us, God's people, that we do be generous with our money, with our possessions. And we properly value what we have. Now that's key there. That's a key thing to understand that we have to properly value. We have to assess proper value to the things that we own, the things that we possess. Don't overvalue it. Don't undervalue it. All right, that's the inverse. The last thing, the last S is scope. And what this commandment, do not steal, reveals to us is that there is a whole set of actions for which we are to take stewardship over. Stewardship. Now, that's a great big word, and we have some young youth group students here who may not know what that word means, so let me explain it for us all. Stewardship, it's a big word that means to take care of something that's been given to you. Take care of something that has been given to you to take care of. Now, a classic example of this is when you're a little kid, you probably beg your parent for a dog or a cat. Oh God, our dog, dad, dad, mom, dad, please give me a dog, right? And your parents looked at you and said, okay, either you're responsible enough if I give you this dog to take care of it, or you are not responsible enough to take care of it. Either way, they are expecting you to be a steward of what's been given to you, a steward of that, right? You've been given the responsibility of taking care of something that has also been given to you. Now that definition is very key to understanding this, this whole commandment. And we're going to see why in just a little bit. But I want us to be very clear on that definition. Being a steward means to take care of something that has been given to you. All right? Stewardship. Now, also before we begin, um, this past week I was studying a, a few passages and I came across Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to, to 40. Now, I wish I had studied this passage when we first began our series on the Ten Commandments, you know, two months ago. Um, but I'm grateful that I, I was able to see this and God was revealing this to me because it, it speaks volumes to what we do uh, in terms of understanding these Ten Commandments for us. And just to set the context of what's going on here in this passage, you have a group of Pharisees who are all kind of like religious know-it-alls and they bring a lawyer with them and they go to test Jesus. And in verse 36, this lawyer asked Jesus, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? You can imagine the lawyer is basically, whether he's trying to trap him or whether he's just trying to earnestly seek an answer, he's basically telling Jesus, all right, you know what? We have all these rules. We have these commandments. We have all these things that, these cultural laws that we have to follow. Jesus, give me the Cliff Notes version, right? Give me something that I can just hang my hat on. And as long as I do this, keep it simple, do this, I am honoring the commandments. All right? What does it all boil down to? And notice how Jesus responds to this. This is a passage that I've heard maybe a thousand times, but I wasn't able to connect the dots until now, and I'm grateful for God to be able to do so because I think it's going to really bless our church as we go forward here. 
In verse 37, Jesus says to this lawyer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. But he's not done there yet, right? Verse 39 says, and the second is like it. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus says, love God, but then this also one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I love this for our group. Because basically Jesus is like saying to us, okay, you want to boil it down to one thing, something you can remember, here it is, I'll give it to you. And, and brothers and sisters, HCPC, youth group, EM, if there's something that you, I want you to remember going forward, if, there's, if you forget everything that's been talked about these past couple months about the Ten Commandments, if you can remember this, you are winning <laughs> at this, at this ser sermon series. And you're winning in life, basically, as a Christian. It all boils down to this. Love God and love your neighbor. Because this, what Jesus is telling us is something very convicting to us about these Ten Commandments. If what Jesus is saying is true, that all the commandments boil down to loving God and loving your neighbor. He is saying that with each of these Ten Commandments, you should be spurned, your capacity to love God should grow in relation to your capacity to love your neighbor. Let me say that really quick. Let me say that again, all right? If it doesn't cause you to love God more in the same way that it causes you to also love your neighbor more, then these commandments are useless. Now, many of us, we can learn, we can memorize the Hebrew. We can understand the verb conjugations, the nuances. We can uh, uh, recite the, the cultural, historical context of the day, the first century the ancient Near East audience here and interpret it the way they would have interpreted it. We can do all these things here, but if these commandments and each of these commandments don't cause you to love God more in the same way, and also in the same way love your neighbor more, then you miss the boat. And these commandments are useless. You see, we have an imperative, we have a directive from God to truly love him and love our neighbors. Those two things go hand in hand. You cannot say you love God, you cannot say you worship God, and yet have total disdain for your neighbor. This should be very convict convicting, especially in our time here today, when there is so much argument over everything it seems like. There are just lines being drawn in the sand every single day. You're either with me on this or you're the enemy. Christians, we have a directive to love God and love our neighbor. That should be our guiding light. That should be whether or not we understand, we can tell for ourselves whether or not we understand all these commandments. And bringing it down to the eighth commandment here, there's a very special way in which we are to love God more and love our neighbor through this commandment. So let's go over that here today. Loving God. For this commandment, when we properly understand this commandment regarding our possessions, the things that we are to be stewards over, to love God properly through this commandment is to understand and to recognize and to really believe in your heart that all that you have belongs to God. Remember, that was the definition of stewardship, right? Stewardship means that you are given something and you have to take care of it. You are given something as a gift that you did not earn, that you did not receive, uh, um, have anything to do with, and you are to take care of it. We are the recipients of everything that we have, not the gift, not the not the earners. We have to understand that. Um, I know many of us are hard workers, and that's a great thing. I'm not trying to knock people who are working hard. But the attitude, the, the mindset that we have in terms of how to be grateful for what we have, it comes with first, first understanding that 
a vast majority, 90, 95, 99% of everything that we've done, that we've, that we've earned, that we thought we've earned, um, is because of out, uh, circumstances that are outside of our control. Think about it. Think about the parents that you were born into, the family that you were born into, the financial circumstance that you were born into, the things, the, the, the gifts and the talents that you received, right? These are all things that are outside of your circumstances, your health. Um, back when I was in high school, I went on, on a mission trip to Oaxaca, Mexico. Oaxaca, there's this certain region of Mexico was way deep in the mountains. And there are people that have been living there for generations and generations. And at the time, it was almost untouched to the outside world. The specific village we went to was out, untouched to the outside world, basically. Right. And so I met a guy there named Abel. Abel was one of the hardest workers I've ever met in my life. I think he told me he started working when he was five years old out in the fields. But he, knows, he knew how to do everything. He was a plumber. He was a masonry expert, um, a carpenter electrician, uh, did I say plumber? Plumber. <laughs> um, he knew how to do everything in and around the village, right? And so he was kind of like the go-to guy. He was constantly busy from five in the morning until eight at night, he was working, working. You know. Abel is still there in Oaxaca. We got to understand that no matter how, there for people like Abel, there are people that are, are born and they're going to be in that state and it has nothing to do with how hard they work. Right? Their success their monetary success has nothing to do with how hard they work and has everything, everything to do with the circumstances that they were born into. Some of us here in Hawaii, here on the mainland, we were just born into better circumstances. And that accounts for 90, 95, 99% of what, that, what determines whether or not we are successful or not. This is an idea that we have to understand because as People who say we are redeemed by the grace of God, we understand that grace is truly just a, a free gift that has been given to us by God. And our only, our only reaction to this is gratitude. To recognize that all that we have, we are mainly stewards. We've been given it as a gift. And now we have the responsibility of taking care of it of properly um, judging, valuing, appropriating our resources is something that God has entrusted to all of us who claim to be Christian. So that's number one. We recognize that all that we have belongs to God. And, and the way that we show this, the greatest way that we show that we actually do believe this is with our tithes and with our offering. Tithe is T-I-T-H-E-S. <laughs> Tithes. Um, it's basically giving God 10% of everything that we do um, in terms of work, our work paycheck, 10%. The idea here, now I've heard many pastors preach on tithes and they preached it in terms of um, laying a seed, but I don't think that's 100% correct, right? They'll say things like, um, have the faith to give God this 10% and have the faith that you are sowing a seed, that God is going to bless you 10 times what you've uh, put down. To me, that doesn't seem all the way right. To me, that sounds like a down payment then. And you're not showing that you believe that God is, 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 is uh, you're grateful for God. You're just doing it as a down payment. God, it's like the marshmallow experiment. God, I know if I put this down, I wait, I'm going to get two back in return. Right? Um, the reason why tithes is considered an act of worship is because it's our way of showing God with the thing that we, most for most of us is the most important thing ever in our life. It's the most fundamental thing that we have is the ability to make money so that we can provide, so that we can eat, so that we can have shelter and clothes. We are saying, you know what, God, this is all yours. We recognize that you have entrusted us to be stewards with it. You have given all this to us. We have had very little, if not anything at all, to do with our own success. And so, God, I'm going to show you that with this tangible gift that I'm giving back to you. My old youth, pa my old youth pastor, um, he was really great at this. He was so generous. And it, I believe it comes from a very generous heart that he possessed. Um, he said something to us when we were youth kids that I'll never forget. <laughs> 
It's something I still carry with me. He says, it's all God's. I believe that. And God lets me, and God only asks for 10% of it back. Right? He lets me do whatever I want with the other 90%, right? God lets us do 90, with whatever we want with 90% of what he gives to us. He just wants 10% of it back. And it's our way of showing God, yes, God, this right here, I only have this because of you anyways. So I'm going to prove this is my outward expression of the inward work that you've already done in my heart. Right? Now, I know right now times are very, very tough. And some of you have been laid off from your job. Some of you are, are just really struggling to make rent. Hey, I've been there too. Um, we're struggling. We've struggled too. So what we understand with this is that, yes, there are seasons. There are seasons. Some seasons you have no income coming in. That's okay. God understands that. But you can still offer a tithe of your heart. You can still offer a tithe of your time, of your effort. Right? There are, t money is not our only resource that we have that we can offer as a tithe. And for right now, what, if, you, if there's no money coming in, God's not going to expect you to give you give him 10% of nothing. But he will say, well, what are, the, what, are the, what are the things that I'm asking you to steward now then besides money? What are some of the things that I'm giving to you now, resources that I'm providing for you that, that I still want you to recognize is coming from me? And how are you going to show me that you're giving that 10% that back to me? That's what a tithe is. Youth group, kids. Um, if you get an allowance, right, for maybe doing yard work or washing the dishes or, or doing laundry, if your parents give you an allowance, that needs to be tithed, right? If you uh, want to show and express your love to Christ and say, you know what, I'm, I recognize the, the stewardship that you've given to me. And if I get, you know, $100 a month, I'm going to tie that $10 then that month. And I'm going to give that to the Lord because that is showing God, hey, God, I recognize that this all comes from you anyways. Right? We need to have good habits from the very beginning of whether or not, whether or not we are tithing at all. Right? And giving God our offerings. Uh, many of you are still getting maybe a dollar or two dollars from your parents, and that's great. But when you give it, I want you all to recognize you're not just putting two dollars in an offering basket, right? What you're doing is you're saying, as you are putting your money in the offering basket, God, I recognize that I am the recipient of an of a immeasurable grace. That you rescued me from out of bondage, out of slavery. I recognize that. And everything that I have now is, is, is considered a gift. So here it is, me showing you that I recognize that it's been a gift and I'm going to give this back to you. All right. So this is um, um, step one of how this commandment is tangibly laid out in our lives. How we show God that, God, we are being good stewards with the possessions that you've given to us. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Peter writes, As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. We are all the recipients of varying degrees of grace. And the way that we show that we are honoring the fact that we have received this grace is through our varied tithes. The amount doesn't matter. The heart does. God always looks at the heart. All right. Um, the second part of every commandment, as we learned today, is that it should also help us to grow in our capacity to love one another. It should also shape our community here at Living Stones. And I'm not talking about uh, our greater community in general. I'm talking about our church family, Living Stones church family. How is this shaping us as a community? Well, I understand I've only been here for a little bit over a year, and some of you have been here a lot longer. But whether you've been here a couple of months or whether this is your first time, whether you grew up here in this church, we all carry with us small and minor, as well as major aggressions and um, feelings of wrongdoing. People have wronged us within our community, right? We're a relatively small group, but I'm not blind to understand that people have been wronged here in, in our group. And essentially what we're saying when somebody has um, um, wronged us is that they have stolen something from us. Now, I'm not talking about somebody coming into our wallet and taking $20 out. Right? That's not the kind of stealing that we're talking about here. We're talking about a, an emotional, spiritual stealing here. Right? They may have stolen your trust. They may have stolen your confidence. They may have stolen your emotions. They may have said something to you. Right? They may have said something very belittling to you, something very hurtful. 
Or maybe they flat out betrayed you, right? Maybe you felt betrayed by somebody here in our own community. And this commandment here for us, we are recognizing here that our common story, our common story is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Our common story is the fact that we recognize that when somebody has taken something from us and stolen something from us, in order to forgive that person, the person doing the forgiving, we have to eat the cost of what's been stolen. Right? Right? That, that, that forgiveness isn't free. We have somebody has to eat the cost of it. And when we forgive, that's why forgiveness is so hard. That's why it's so hard to really just understand that um, past wrongs don't just kind of disappear. They say time heals on all, all wounds, but that's not necessarily true. Right? Some of us are still harboring resentment that we've had for uh, a friend in our group or a family member for a very long, long, long time. We recognize that time does not heal all wounds. We recognize that for true forgiveness to happen, somebody has to eat the cost for it. And that somebody is the person doing the forgiving. And so, like I said, our common story as people who say we have been redeemed by Christ, and we recognize that Christ has redeemed us first. We recognize that we have mounted an insurmountable debt against God through our sin, through our status of sin before God. And Christ on the cross has eaten that cost for us. Forgiving those who have stolen from you comes at that tremendous cost of absorbing it. And so when we feel like we've been wrong, when, when there's just little microaggressions among us all, when there's misunderstandings, maybe there's been a, a text that has been sent and, and, and the text has been misread, the, the tone of the intent has been misunderstood. Either way, there's been divisions, there's been uh, slow simmering feelings of resentment towards one another. We recognize that this commandment is telling us, yes, yeah, maybe you have had something stolen from you. Maybe you had something, somebody has seriously wronged you. But we recognize also that we are worshiping God who has eaten the cost for us. And so we want to be a church. We want to be a group that strives, that constantly strives, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much hurt there is, at the very least we are striving for reconciliation. That's where we are different from any other group in terms of a church versus a community group or a social gathering. Right? For us, our unity is not based on how well we can keep the relations going, but how well we can focus on Christ. How well we can keep the gospel at, at the true center of all that we do. And when we are wrong, we don't just cut ties. We don't just ghost people. We maintain that um, striving towards reconciliation, even when it, it hurts. We commit to one another, not because we are so great to one another. We commit to another because we know that Jesus Christ has committed to us no matter what. That's what we are holding at the very center of our group. And if we can keep that at the very center, if we keep that at the focus, then our group will continue to be molded and shaped into the community that God wants us to be because we are honoring the spirit of the Ten Commandments where we love God in relation to loving our neighbors, loving each other. Brothers and sisters, I understand that uh, forgiveness is a very hard thing to do. And um, there might be divisions within us that have existed long before I even was, uh, I got here and will maybe even continue to exist um, well into the future. But let us not give up. Let us not just say, all right, you know what? This person is going to be cut out of my life. Let us continue to strive towards that reconciliation because we, we know we are going to see God really move in those moments. Because it's in those hard moments where God really moves, not in the things where things are going easy, right? Where we're coasting. When we have to really rely on God for a supernatural change of heart. Let us be leaders in our community through this example. 
Let us show the world how we truly love each other by committing to one another, not because of some uh, friendship bonds, but because of the bond we had in, together in Christ. Brothers and sisters, let me pray for you, and let's continue our worship uh, with a song of response. Let me pray. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for your word, for this commandment, for it's more than just possessions. It's truly a, a matter of the heart. What we do believe that, what we really believe in our hearts that we've earned and what we've been given, and being able to distinguish the two. And may that be the baseline of all that we do, Lord God, knowing that we are being forgiven and we are continuing to be forgiven of tremendous debt before you. May that be our common story here at Living Stones. It may be something that is uh, a sweet aroma to those around us. That we are different because we are uh, clinging to the gospel of your son Jesus Christ. May you continue to be with us in our worship here today as we respond with a song of praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our worship with a song of response to our Lord. Sun cannot bear. Sun cannot compare to the glory of love. There is no shadow in your presence. No more man would dare stand for your throne before the Holy One of Heaven. sisters, I want to remind you once again that um, you can give your tithes and your offerings as an act of worship. Um, you can do that online, uh, hawaiicpc.org. Uh, click on the blue offering button on the upper right hand corner of the screen. And as you do so, as you're making your tithes, remember, keep in mind that this is an act of worship. It's not just a couple clicks and just to get it done as if it's an errand. We are um, making that offering uh, as a, a sign of, 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 of understanding that we are recipients of God's grace. We are living and breathing and existing only by His, by His merciful hand. So that is a, an, an act of worship and I hope that we are treating it as such. Um, or if you'd like to continue to make your uh, tithes and offerings down here in person, uh, there's a drop box right in front of these doors here. You can go ahead and drop off your offering uh, as, the, as a physical act of worship there as well. Uh, brothers and sisters, HCPC, Living Stones, English Ministry, receive now a blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen, everyone. Go in peace. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.